two views about incentives here applied to education, to teaching and learning. There are some, like Alicia and Sabrina, former teachers, who seem to feel that the financial incentive will corrupt or diminish or erode or crowd out other values, intrinsic values, the love of reading for its own sake. And there are others who disagree, who say, well, no, maybe this is at least a way to get kids to read in the first place, then maybe, maybe the love of learning will catch on later, and maybe by paying them money, they will learn a good lesson about how our society works, that you get financial rewards if you work hard and you don't if you don't. So what, this is partly an empirical question. I should tell you what happened with these experiments. The cash for grades or test scores had very mixed results and did not produce appreciable improvements in outcomes. The kids who were paid $2 for each book did read more books. They also read shorter books. <laughs> but the real question is what will become of these kids as they develop and as they grow up and go out into the world? Will they have learned the lesson that hard work brings rewards, the good habits, or will they learn the lesson by this incentive that reading is a chore, a kind of piecework to be done for pay, and if that's the lesson they learn, that's the worry of Alicia and Sabrina, if that's the lesson they learn, then the cash incentive will have driven out or made more difficult to acquire the intrinsic love of reading for its own sake and to learn. Now, we can glimpse, even in this brief debate, something of importance about economic reasoning in general. And it arises in many places. Economists often assume, wrongly, that markets and market exchanges never change the value or the meaning of the goods being traded. The idea is that markets are inert, they're neutral, and the value of the goods is independent of the way in which they're acquired. This assumption may be true enough when we're talking about material goods, cars, toasters, flat screen televisions. If you sell me a flat screen television or give me one as a gift, the value of the good will be the same. It will work just as well either way. But the same may not be true if we're talking about non-material goods, personal relations, family life, health, education, civic life. In those arenas, introducing market values may undermine or corrupt or crowd out non-market values worth caring about. Some economists did an experiment. In Israel every year they have what they call a donation day where high school students spend a day going door to door raising funds for charitable causes. One year they did an experiment. They divided the students into three groups. The first group was given a short motivational speech about the importance of the causes for which they were raising money and sent on their way. The second group was given the same speech and offered a 1% commission on everything they raised. The third group, same speech, they were offered a 10% commission. Which group do you think raised the most money? Every, some people say the third group, the 10%, others say the first group. No one chose the second. Actually, the first group on no commission raised the most money. Now, the standard economic assumption did work to this extent. Those paid the 10% commission did raise more than those offered 1%. The price effect matters. But those who were paid nothing actually raised more even than those on the 10% commission. 
This experiment bears out the intuition that came out in the discussion about paying kids to read the books. Sometimes introducing a cash incentive or a monetary value can change the meaning of the activity. In the case of the donation day, what had been a civic project, part of their moral education, was changed, it seems, by the financial incentive into something else, into a kind of deal, into a job, a job on a commission. The meaning of the activity changed. So one assumption that we need to rethink, and it runs very deep in economics, is the idea that markets and monetary values never change the meaning of goods. If we're going to have a public debate about where markets serve the public good and where they don't belong, we have to ask not only about the effects, the efficiency effects, we have also to ask about the normative consequences, the way in which extending market reasoning and market thinking into non-material domains may change the, the meaning of moral and civic life. <clears throat> 